and Rudolf Dassler and the sports footwear factory they ran together. There was always strife between them, serious strife. Basically, they were deadly enemies. They went their separate ways. One brother founded Adidas, the other Puma, in the same town. If someone worked for Puma, their son wasn't allowed to play for Adidas. And the battle continues even today. Puma versus Adidas, or versus France. The final of the 2006 World Cup was a duel of the two team sponsors. At stake, prestige and market share. We're represented in 56% of all games, so we're the dominant brand on the pitch. We have to dominate this World Cup and show the world that Adidas is clearly number one in football. Countless people, even outside the stadium, were witness to an old duel. A brand war was being fought, a war between two brothers. It all began in a wash house in the south German town of Herzogen Aurach, where young Adi Dassler designed and made footwear for sport. Later, he was joined by his brother Rudolf. Together, they made plans. Setting up a business at that time, in 1920, was a brave move indeed. I take my hat off to them. Although their characters were quite different, until the big split came, the two brothers had got on really well together. They also had things in common. From an early age, Adolf, who was known as Addy, and Rudolf, who was two years older, spent every spare minute outdoors doing sport. There was always a certain rivalry between the two, especially at sports festivals where Adolf repeatedly tried to outdo Rudolf. Soon became clear that Addy was better at sport than Rudolf. No matter how hard his older brother tried. Their talents were different in the workshop too. When it came to the workbench, Addy had all the skills. He'd spend days and nights developing one gym shoe after another. Adolf was a very placid person. Someone rooted in the soil, rather unobtrusive. But when his work was involved, he really came to life. Their characters certainly were different. As the company grew and discussions with new employees and customers became increasingly important, it became clear that while Addy was an excellent designer and craftsman inventor, Rudolf was an outstanding salesman, a born businessman. Er hat die große Goschen gehabt, ne? He had the gift of the gab. When you're building up a business, nobody comes to you of their own accord. You've got to make yourself known. And that was my brother-in-law's forte. He built up the business on the basis that he would look after the commercial side while my brother attended to the technical side. Rudolf Dassler didn't really belong in a quiet, sleepy place like Herzogen Aurach. He liked to present himself as a man of the world. Rudolf set up a family long before his brother. He and his wife Friedel had a son, Armin. A young father and newly fledged businessman, Rudolf Dassler faced a bright future. He was a real figure of authority, someone not afraid to raise his voice. I always remember him as a really important person who usually smoked a pipe or a cigar. In his way, he was very authoritarian. I know that he was a highly impulsive person, someone who also had an eye for the ladies, and he was very popular with the fairer sex. The whole town knew that Rudolf Dassler was a lady killer, and Friedel, his wife, was also aware of his affairs. She too knew that he had an eye for the ladies, and sadly she found out about a local affair while she was expecting their child. That was terrible for my sister. It was actually the worst thing to bear because she wasn't so much confronted with his dalliances when he was on holiday. 
Quite a few men went astray when they were on holiday, but news of an escapade closer to home filtered through, and that, of course, was really painful for my sister. In 1933, Adolf Hitler seized power. The Dasslers interpreted the signs of the new era in their own particular way. They reckoned it opened up a host of opportunities for them because the Nazis too were keen on sporting activity. Lots of new gym shoes were needed. Soon, flags bearing the swastika could be seen all over Herzogen Aurach too. Adi and Rudolf Dassler didn't intend to be left in the wings. In May 1933, only a few months after Hitler was elected, the Dassler brothers became members of the Nazi party. Years later, they were to regret the step. But at the time, the Dasslers were still focused on building up their joint company and on little else. Obviously, a company like the Dassler Brothers firm benefited greatly from the government backing Sport received. It was one way of getting young people involved in National Socialism. There was plenty going on in the family circle too. Another wedding was about to take place and it was being celebrated as a minor sensation because Addy had been regarded as a dyed-in-the-wool bachelor. Kita, Addy's blonde bride, came from the shoemaking town of Pamazans. So in the narrow world of Herzogen Aurach, she was someone from outside. Rudolf was best man. <laughs> By now, the Dasslers were among the town's wealthiest citizens. The two couples got on really well together. At first, that is. Because of the booming demand for gym shoes under the Nazi regime, the Dassler brothers needed bigger and bigger factory buildings. The company grew rapidly. The two wives, Addis Keta and Rudolf Friedel, also played a role in running it, even after they'd recently given birth. Friedel usually worked through from Saturday to Sunday. She was a real Trojan. She did all the bookkeeping. My sister simply fitted in to the family firm community. In the Gemeinschaft. After the birth of their son, Horst, Addy's wife, Keta, was also expected to play a full role in the company, but she had a mind of her own. When Keta arrived, she refused to fit in. She was only 17 when she got married, but she already knew what she wanted, and she went her own way. Friedel, the reserved wife, and Keta, the single-minded one. Conflict was pre-programmed. You could almost feel the tension between the two women. Keta had brought commercial ambition into the marriage. Adolf would never have been able to set up a firm on his own. That was all Keta's work. She was the driving force. When it came to business, Rudolf and Kater were virtually cast in the same mould. As yet, this was of no importance at all to the next generation. Armin, Rudolf and Friedel's son, and Horst, the son of Adi and Kater, the two cousins got on well together. But that wouldn't always be the case. Despite the tension between Friedel and Kater, the two families moved into a splendid house together, right next to the factory. Adolf and his family lived on the ground floor. The first floor belonged to Rudolf and his family, and above them lived the parents. All under one roof. That was bound to cause problems. Disputes became more and more frequent. When two brothers build up a family, it's fairly natural in the initial stages for them to work together. The company grows. The brothers and their sons get older. The sons marry, so the number of families increases. But having several families in one company rarely works out. Summer 1936. For a while, new business opportunities push the problems into the background. Athletes from all over the world flock to Berlin to compete in the Olympic Games. 
among them black superstar Jesse Owens. News of his arrival also reached Herzogenaurach. Adi Dassler set out to offer the track and field ace handmade running shoes. The Olympic Stadium was the perfect stage for the Dassler brothers' products. The eyes of the world were focused on Adolf Hitler, and it was hoped they'd also notice the running shoes made by a far less prominent Adolf. The shoemaker from the provinces made it into the Olympic Village, and Jesse Owens was most impressed by Adolf Dassler's new running shoes, which were fitted with spikes. They got on well right away. That was only logical. I've often seen it with athletes who had direct contact. Since the goal's the same, there's total understanding. So Owens was given shoes straight away. Shoes that really were made to measure orthopedically for him, even in those days. And he went in them. Though he might well have run barefoot and still triumphed. It was only later, of course, that they realized what a tremendous advantage they held. Jesse Owens had won gold medals wearing shoes they had developed. That was a huge boost, and it was also mentioned in the firm's advertising. The outbreak of war knocked the Dassler's plans firmly on the head. Both brothers were called up, but Addy was soon allowed to return to the firm. As an artisan, together with a handful of employees, he was ordered to ensure that production continued. Initially of boots, and then of poorly made bazookas. Conflict between the two brothers was pre-programmed. It's well known that the two brothers were conscripted a second time, even though both were over 40. But after only a year, Adolf was brought back to run the company. Rudolf often had to report for duty. There were rumors, for instance, that he was with the Gestapo. Later he was able to refute this, but the gulf between the two families, it seems, grew wider and wider. And one day they suddenly decided to go their own separate ways. Rudolf, the soldier, was far off when Allied bombers targeted his home region. Friedel, his wife, sought protection in the cellar along with her sister, Betty Bilvach, and son Armin. The day the bombs fell marked a turning point for Herzogen Aurach and for the Dasslers. Keta, her son Horst and Adolf were the last to find refuge. A union born of necessity emerged in the most cramped conditions. Adolf paced up and down in the cellar. They're back again, the swine, he kept saying. Rudolf and Friedel's mistrust of Adi and Keta now manifested itself in blatant accusations. My sisters, my grandmother was also present, thought he meant them. But that wasn't true. Adolf would never have done that. Swine. So who was Addy really referring to? The bomber pilots or Friedel, his brother's wife? She suspected anyway that Addy planned to dispute her Rudolf's right to the factory. I kept telling my sister and my grandmother, all of them, that Adolf didn't mean us. He was referring to the Allied bombers. No, he meant us, they said. So I went to Keita and told her that I knew for certain that Adolf was referring to the bombers. But I couldn't make them see that. Keita then really vented her spleen, telling me what her husband had to go through and what she had to put up with from Rudolf. 
Before he got married, she went on, Adolf had left everything up to Rudolf. I must say that my brother-in-law could be a real despot, but he never bore a grudge. Adolf, however, will have grumbled to his wife, and his complaints will, of course, have fallen on fertile ground. The end of the war did not make the situation in the Dassler household any less tense. On the contrary, Rudolf finally returned home, but then the Americans came round to talk to his brother, Addy. After all, Addy was a confessed Nazi. Addy Dassler was called to account for himself. He pointed out that he had equipped American athletes at the Olympic Games. His American interrogators were impressed and released him. So, could the old firm start operating again as if nothing had happened? The big issue, of course, was who would run the company, which, after the war, had become established again and was doing well. Naturally, each brother wanted to head the company himself and perhaps also outmaneuver the other. But something else must have happened to turn two brothers against each other who, before the war, had run the company so successfully. Rudolf was also summoned for questioning by the Americans. And his Nazi past proved a real problem for him, too. The Americans mistrusted him, and Rudolf really had to battle for his future and his factory. At first, he declared himself that he'd worked for the Gestapo, but later retracted his statement. Rudolf Dassler was sent to an American internment camp, and while he was there, a nasty suspicion grew in him. In the internment camp, some American told him that he had been denounced by someone close to him. His first thought, of course, was that it was his brother who wanted to take possession of the firm, which by this time had been built up again. And that, to put it mildly, made him very angry. I think he, he bore a particular grudge. He was particularly suspicious towards his sister-in-law. He, he, uh, he was very suspicious of her, feeling that she was really, you know, whereas Adi would be generally a calmer sort of person, uh, that she would be really very, very much more manipulative and, you know, trying to seize control. But did Adolf and his Keta really want to force Rudolf out of the family factory? Rudolf had no solid proof of this. Even so, he could no longer restrain himself. Rudolf was ready to go to war again, this time against his brother. And he told the Americans that his internment could only have been the result of false and malicious accusations. But a traitor? In his own family? While Rudolf was being held by the Americans, his brother Adolf went in search of new business. The Americans wanted him to make baseball and basketball boots. It meant, first of all, that the firm had work coming in, that it was able to survive in those extremely difficult days after the war, that it could obtain material. Above all, though, that it was able to acquire expertise. Prior to that, no one had any idea about American sports like baseball and football. So it was a really good time for the company. Adolf Dassler was here. He was the younger brother, the more dynamic one. He ran everything together with his wife. Wife. On the other side, there was Friedel Dassler, who tried to protect her husband's share of the company. Naturally, she also strove to play her part in the film, but she was simply at a disadvantage. It was only after 12 harrowing months that Rudolf was released from the internment camp. But where was he to go? The Dassler villa had been requisitioned by the Americans, so the other members of the family were living in the factory tower. In these cramped conditions, the sons of Rudolf and Adolf, Armin and Horst, watched their parents clash more and more fiercely. Now old scores were being settled. It was all about money. The fight between the two families was all about money. 
Then, quite unexpectedly, Adolf was interrogated a second time. And he dashed was in major trouble with his denazification process. And according to, to the files, Rudolf Dassler really did uh, you know, all he could to discredit his brother, uh, you know, bad-mouthing him uh, to the authorities, uh, bringing in so-called evidence that, that you know, uh, 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 Adi and Kate disputed very, you know, very, very violently. So who was telling the truth, Adolf or Rudolf? The Americans shelved the case. The brothers were now free and mortal enemies. So when you've reached a point where you know, two brothers uh, start spreading uh, extremely malicious stories about each other in front of the authorities, I, I, you know, I, I don't think you can run a business together. The only solution was to divide up the firm. The workforce had to be told. The time to separate had come. In Estagas, one day, Rudolf had us assemble and told us that they decided to go their separate ways. He said it was up to us to choose whom we wanted to work for in the future and that we should say so quite openly. Neither brother would be offended, whatever our personal choices might be. I was hired by Rudolf and I was no longer afraid of him. So I thought, why shouldn't I go with him? The workforce was stunned. What on earth had happened between the two brothers? No one knew for sure, so rumors spread. I discussed it at length with my father, because he had his own personal theory, a view which, since then, has also been expressed by other people. So I'm not about to say something that could cost me my head. His theory was that Horst Dassler, the son of Adolf Dassler, wasn't Adolf Dassler's son at all, but the son of his father, Rudolf Dassler. Rudolf's reputation as a lady killer had caught up with him. An affair with his sister-in-law, Kate, a liaison between two people who had apparently come to hate each other, some citizens of Herzog and Aurach thought the very idea preposterous. But where Rudolf was concerned, others thought that a very real possibility. We'll never know whether there's any truth in it. But somehow it would explain the seriousness of their conflict. There was nothing whatsoever between Kata and Rudolf. And anyone who suggests there was should have their face slapped. That's just plain scheming. There's no truth in the rumor. The breach was final. Employees had to decide to go with Addy, the quiet inventor, or Rudolf, the efficient salesman. It was a tough choice. Dividing up the material is no problem, nor machinery. The problem was people. You can't just push them to and fro. When the decision had to be taken, two-thirds of the workforce sided with Addy, most of them shoemakers. The rest, mainly salesmen, opted for Rudolf. I got the feeling that they were both glad that things had come to a head. I noticed that when, after we'd moved in upstairs, our boss said, at last, we're on our own. And we'll show that lot over there just what we're capable of. Those were his first words. Adidasler founded Adidas and Rudolf, Puma, just 500 meters apart. The war between two brothers turned into fierce rivalry between two companies. From now on, Herzog and Aurach was divided by a deep gulf. The local population was gradually drawn into the conflict. In the end, there were even two soccer clubs who were at daggers drawn. If you went into the pub, you wouldn't see a Puma employee sitting at the same table as people who work for Adidas or vice versa. So employees really supported their bosses either out of fear or really out of conviction that they were with the right man. In her 